special guest, Dave Asprey. We are about to go on a voyage that's going to cover all kinds of controversial things from cannibalism to on a desert island <laughs> um, to uh, kickstands from red lights to living to 180, okay, to how much protein you really need to is the four hour workout per week the right number? Should you be running like David Goggins or can you do it all in 15 minutes a week? We got a lot of controversial yet scientifically validated conversations coming your way. The show notes and links to all of the good info Dave's giving and to get his book, tylopez.com slash Dave Asprey podcast. tylopez.com slash Dave Asprey podcast. Dave, before we go into cannibalism and living to 180, um, you used to weld, before you were successful, you were welding Toyota truck frames. Who taught you to weld? I learned to weld on a farm from Joel Salatin. Who, who, how'd you learn this? I, I learned at a training program from a company called Dana Automotive. Um, and we were a subcontractor who made Toyota truck frames that got sent to the plant in Fremont where today Tesla makes cars. <laughs> so I would just tell you, do not buy a mid nineties Toyota pickup truck. If I touched it with my welding, I apologize. It's probably off the road. I was not a good welder, but I, you know, you make ends meet. So like, it's kind of an ironic, I mean, not to be cheesy, but it's like you were, you were piecing things together. It was almost like you were a hacker and now you've hacked the body. I was certainly, I was 300 pounds anyway. <laughs> I don't know. I was a 300 pound welder and con then computer hacker. <laughs> and now I'm a biohacker. That's probably a better place to what be. What was next? Then you went to Silicon Valley or what? where'd you go I, from there? I was finishing school. I was getting a degree in information systems with a concentration in artificial intelligence. And uh, so I got that. And then I went from there to Silicon Valley. Welcome everybody to today's episode this is a reunion episode. Last time Dave Asprey was in my garage, the, the here in my garage in the Hollywood Hills. I think that was either 13 or 14. It's been about a decade. Yeah, something like that. 13, 14 or uh, 15. It must, it must have been around 14, I, I would guess. That, that yeah, was during so the, almost the books, Lamborghini. Books, Lamborghini phase. That was the books. That, that, and really, you're... You were in my garage 2014. That was pre here in my garage. You were the original one that saw the That's garage. True. It was still getting put together uh, when I was there. We yeah. So that was 2014 because I got that that Ferrari I got in and for Halloween 2014. So I remember it vividly. Well, we're going to jump into this. I'm, I, I follow you on Instagram. So I see a lot of your biohacking. I'm super myself. I've been over the last five years. I did this kind of million dollars. I spent about 250 grand a year testing every health hack, learn some things from you and your books and your social media and um, learn from as many smart people. So, you know, I, I talk about the four pillars of the good life and a lot of entrepreneurs figure out how to make money, but what is, what is a profit a man to gain the world, but lose their health, right? I wanted to just jump in and just because you've done so many things. You've got Bulletproof, your best-selling author. I see you blowing up on social media. If you were, this is a question I came up with. I was thinking about this podcast ahead of time, and I was like, Dave, you're on a desert island. You're Gilligan's Island. You're going to be there for three, you're going to be there for three years. You know it's going to happen. You're going to be isolated, but you'll be okay. It's a tropical island. There's enough water, but you can only have three foods. What are the three foods you're bringing with you to the desert island? I've asked myself this around and, and you're a smart guy, so I wanted to get your input. I mean, logically speaking, it would have to be uh, a female army ranger <laughs> because the, okay. they can make anything into food. And if that doesn't work, you could eat them because they're made out of meat. So like, how could you lose? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So that's one is another human. Who knows? <laughs> yeah. All right. We got a little cannibal. We got a little silence Ideally, of the land that, That's going. part of your intermittent fast, fasting practice. But hey, you know, if worse comes to worse, um, there you go. What would I bring? Um, I would bring a cow. Okay. Because you can eat a cow. It also makes milk. You didn't tell me that food had to be dead. No, that's a good answer. 
That's a valid answer. <laughs> I would also just bring like the whole cow ground up into a patty with all the organ meats, even though it tastes kind of gross, except I couldn't really preserve it unless you give me a refrigerator and then we're okay. going to have, you know, big, maybe a jacuzzi in a freezer. Can we add those? <laughs> sure. <laughs> no, at a certain point. So you're like, have you, have you ever, there's a, have you ever heard of Weston Price? He wrote a book. Like the Bulletproof Diet. I talked a lot about that. And yeah, you, you need beef. Uh, it's, it's actually necessary uh, for a bunch of reasons. Um, you're going to be able to catch fish on a desert island or something if you, if you really want to. Uh, but honestly, the highest nutrient thing is going to be the cow uh, and the dairy, grass-fed dairy. One of the reasons you see grass-fed yogurt and butter all over the place, all the foods. With Bulletproof, we created a global shortage of grass-fed butter in 2014, back when we met. Literally, someone went to jail for trying to smuggle grass-fed butter from Norway into Sweden because there was such a shortage. And I totally did that because there's all these articles in Ireland like, look what the Yanks are putting in the coffee now and, and all this crazy stuff. Because grass-fed butter actually is a health food and dairy fat is necessary. Your problem on, a, on an island like that is going to be how do I get enough quality protein and how do I get enough animal fat? You get those things and not fish oil. Fish oil is good, but only in moderate amounts. So you do that, you're just going to look lean, ripped, be full, be happy, and be full of nutrients when they pick you up in three years. Yeah. So would you bring a carb? Would you try to grow I'm assuming, rice? I'm assuming there's probably fruit on the island. If there's no fruit on the island and I could I could bring something that was nutrient dense, it would have to be um, just on a benefits per whatever, it would be raw honey because raw honey is a carb, but it just, it, it makes glycogen in the liver. You could pretty much live off meat and raw honey uh, for an indefinite amount of time if you needed to without ill health effects. And you throw in some dairy in there. The Maasai in Africa in that book, Western Price book, he talks about how they pretty much just live off the cow. They milk, drink the milk, you know, they even bathe in the urine, interestingly enough. And when the cow's old, they eat it and they have occasional, you know. Does that mean they're running for president? That they're running there. There you go. <laughs> yeah, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Anyway, you could get a Maasai stories, shirt. Stories Ooh, from shirt. Russia. Believe it or not, my first protein product, like 10 plus years ago when I was running Bulletproof, um, I wanted to call it Maasai mix, but not enough people knew that. It was a mixture of uh, constant uh, of grass-fed whey protein concentrate and something called albumin or blood serum albumin. What it was yeah. was basically the the really high availability proteins from cow blood like albumin is what you yeah. get during a transfusion of blood like it, it's a very high nutrient thing it's what the maasai were getting by drinking blood yeah they tap the neck of the cow it was a mixture of of those two proteins and people like athletes pro athletes were buying it going what is going on here this is amazing and uh, i think most of that stuff is hard to get now because they're trying to buy it and then use it as the growth medium to grow cruelty-free cultured meat products. Now, you guys realize if you're taking a blood product from cows and then growing cruelty-free fake burgers, they they're still have animals in them. <laughs> but yeah. that, that's why there's a shortage of, of albumin right now. Do you ever recommend drinking blood? Like, because I have my own farm. Do you take the chicken blood, the pigs, cows? You know, pig blood can have a lot of pathogens in it, especially wild pigs. I, I would be careful on that. In fact... Um, I talk a lot about uh, mycotoxins and, and things like that. And it, it, mycotoxins come from mold in food. Mold in coffee is a big thing. I have a new coffee brand that's working with mold in a different way. And, and there's, there's all this stuff. So pig liver is tied to um, cancer of the uh, kidneys because of the same toxin that's present in coffee and beer and wine if it's not properly processed. So I would, I would avoid that from pigs, although pigs, if they're well fed, can be really good for you. It's possible to turn the blood into blood pie and all that stuff, and it's probably really good for you. It's yeah, not a practice. Chitlins and all that stuff. Yeah, it's not a practice that I do, but it's I, <laughs> biologically, it's a good idea. It's just like, it's where do you go to buy blood these days? You know, I, you know what are you going to keep a, uh, you know, it just doesn't seem to make sense um, from a, a business process perspective. Like there isn't a slaughterhouse that collects the blood and then sells it in a clean way. Um, geez, just trying to get raw dairy in half the states is a problem. Just try to imagine getting, you know, cow blood to make, I don't even know how you cook it. Cow, uh, cow pies doesn't sound very, <laughs> very good. <laughs> Yeah, the Maasai, I think they put a little tap in the neck of their cows and just kind of keep the cow alive and they just keep drinking the blood. You know, so I that guess you is could... incredibly efficient. I, I kind of like that. <laughs> I'm going to get you a cow for your birthday. I had three cows on my, so in Canada, I had an organic regenerative farm. So we had three cows, 25 sheep, 25 pigs. 
uh, and a whole bunch of chickens. And man, you can grow amazing vegetables when you have animals present. And when there's no animals, yeah. the soil barely works. It's one of the reasons that um, I have this this new book, um, Smarter Not Harder. I get to wave it around because you know. Yeah, so show the book. Thing. I was reading it on the airplane. Nice. On my last flight. That's why in that early chapter we talk about minerals, right? Because like you can eat all the plants in the world if they're from unhealthy soil, you don't yes. get the minerals you need. And then you're wondering why your workouts don't create results, why you're tired all the time, why your meditation doesn't work. Well, if your body doesn't have whatever trace mineral you needed in order to actually complete the command you told it to do, you're gonna just feel anxiety instead of transforming and evolving. That's why um, Danger Coffee, my new brand of coffee, has a huge amount of trace minerals in it because plant yeah. foods take minerals out of the body. They're not sources of minerals that are useful for the most part. And animal foods put minerals in the body. Now, I just triggered mm -hmm. a bunch of vegans. Guys, I'll just be real blunt about it. If you have sex and there's a condom in the way, you don't get pregnant. Plant minerals have chemical condoms on them so they can't enter your cells. It's the same idea. You, it went in, but you weren't allowed to use it, right? Like that's the, the simplest way I can picture it where people really get it because plants don't have minerals for us to eat. They have a huge way of sucking minerals out of our bodies so that if we eat very many plants, we become weak and then we die and the plants don't. It's, it's a delicate balance in nature, but I see these poor people like I was. I was a raw vegan, uh, and it really, really trashed my health. I cracked teeth. I got autoimmune issues, thyroid issues, and I was a very well-educated guy. I could sprout and blend and all that kind of stuff, juice. Bottom line is plants have minerals that are bound up by things that mean you can't use the minerals. So the fact that someone tells you spinach has iron, they never tell you that 1.7% of the iron is absorbable. So when we go to the desert island example, give me the meat and give me a carb that's easy to digest and I'm good to go. Yeah, I actually, this mineral thing is very interesting. When I was a teenager, I went and I was Joel Salatin's first apprentice on his farm. And I love Joel. Yeah, I was, I lived with the Amish for a couple of years. First thing you learn, and I, I have farms now that are actually in the middle of Amish community and one of them's next to Joel Salatin's farm and people don't understand you know, the most fertile places in the world are these glacier soils, these glaciated soils. That's actually what happened in the Midwest of the United States. It happened in some of Saskatchewan, even the Ukraine, Argentina, some of Scandinavia, Norway. But so Joel used to always say a plant isn't a plant isn't a plant. Like people think, oh, eat tomatoes, they're healthy for you. But it's that mineralization, you know, and you see that in cows if you run cows on soil where the grass has been mineralized, you put seaweed on it, you put compost, the cows look better. I was in southern Chile, which is one of the most fertile places because of volcanoes. The cows literally don't even look like the same species. They're so <laughs> healthy. It's just insane. It's totally true. So I'm glad you're talking about it. So let me ask you this. Go, last question on the desert island. Um, are you, so your take is there's no, you're not bringing kale with you. You're not bringing spinach you're letting the cows eat that and you're eating the cows. Honestly, you'd have to be insane to choose those as your foods uh, <laughs> because there's no calories in them. Right. You could, you could eat $40 worth of kale. You'll be <laughs> stuffed and you'll be hungry. Kale is more expensive than grass fed ribeye because it's like 50 calories for a bunch of bitter, crunchy shit. And it, it, it's not good for you. Sure, it has some polyphenols that you could get from green tea or from arugula, which don't have all of the negative things that kale and spinach have. So if someone picks those, it's not because they're a bad person. It's because they believe something that is not actually real. The reason I wrote Smarter Not Harder is that I believe that working hard and exercising was going to get me results. When I weighed 300 pounds, I'm 23, so I'm going to lose it. Went to the gym six days a week. 90 minutes every day without fail. I did it for 18 months straight. Even if I was sick, no matter what was going on in my life, top priority. End of all of that working out, 702 hours in the gym, I still weighed 300 pounds and I still had a 46 inch waist. But I could max out all the machines at the gym, except for two. So 
I worked hard. I didn't get results. The obvious answer is I didn't work hard enough. I should have eaten less. I was on a semi-vegetarian diet. I was on a low-fat diet and a low-calorie diet because everyone said that's what you do. Work hard. Suffer. It doesn't work. If I'd have had smarter, not harder at that time, I would have saved about 650 hours and I would have lost all the weight. Working hard doesn't get results. That's a false belief instilled in you by churches, by teachers, by coaches, and by people afraid of the fact that our biology is lazy. And if we're not in charge of ourselves, we are wired by Mother Nature to lay on a couch to make sure we don't use too much energy. That's not an acceptable behavior. There is nothing that says working hard creates results. Nothing whatsoever. It's a religious belief. You might as well use the tools that work best. And then you don't have to work so hard and you get better results. And you can also work hard and use the tools that work best. And you could, I don't know, build a $100 million company, five New York Times bestsellers, uh, you know, hundreds of millions of podcast downloads. I don't know. Maybe I just work really hard or maybe I'm just lazy. I'm lazy. I use the tools that work best. And I want people to do that. And there's five categories. And, and I didn't make these up. These are from eight years of running the world's first biohacking facility. You've probably been there, the one in, in Santa Monica. It's called the up, it's called Upgrade Labs. And it's underneath Arnold Schwarzenegger's office. And people go in there, celebrities, pro athletes, and just people in Santa Monica. And we look at you, all right, what is it that you're here for? And it turns out health is not it. Sometimes it's, I want weight. I, I want weight to go on. I want muscle. Sometimes I want cardio. Sometimes my top goal is I want my brain back. I want my energy back. And I want, I want to have pants that fit. Like I don't lose weight. And sometimes I want to know how to manage stress so I'm less anxious and I'm more resilient. Each of those is a discrete and separate goal. We figure out where you want to go, and then we tell you the tech to use in the right order to get there in the least amount of time. And when you read Smarter Not Harder, I tell you how to do that at home. And it's sometimes a tiny fraction of the time, and, and it's almost embarrassingly better than what you've been doing today. Yeah, I, what, I, let me ask you this on the, the new book. You've written lots of books. And by the way, if you go to tylopez.com slash Dave Asprey, it'll take you to the book link to buy the book. tylopez.com slash Dave Asprey. But Dave, so let me ask you this. There's a huge biohacking community. You're one of the big names in it. In your book, what's the most controversial take you have that even people in your community are having issue with, if any? Some people are still trying to say kale's good for you. And I'm just like, guys, stop, right? There are worse foods for you, but it's nowhere near a superfood. So that's controversial for some people. But really, the most controversial thing of all is when I say that hard work doesn't get results. <laughs> like, if you're guys, I really respect guys I've interviewed, um, like Jocko, right? Jocko's a stud. Like, he works his ass off every morning, right? Uh, David Goggins, same thing. Like I respect the grit these guys have. The point here though, is what if they had the same results in 10 minutes instead of two hours a day? Do you think that's possible that you can get that, that similar result in much less time than these guys expend the Jocko's? I, I don't just think it is. I know it is. Every time I see someone out there running out the miles, I just want to, I, I just want to throw up in my mouth a little bit. Here's why. Let me let me just lay it out. Three studies from the University of Colorado support what I'm saying here. Option one, you decide you want to get cardiovascular endurance. You're going to get in shape. So you sign up for a spin class. It's an hour a day, five days a week. Okay, you got to drive there. You got to put on stretchy clothes. You got to listen to Katy Perry or whatever, um, you know, whatever music they're playing. And like someone yells at you and tells you to pedal a lot. And then you pedal a lot because you know that you'll feel shame if other people see you resting. So there's how you motivate yourself. Great life. Okay, then you take a shower when you're done and maybe get some endorphins and all right. So you do this for two months straight. You spent five hours a week. So that's 40 hours plus cleanup time pedaling a bike. You're gonna get 2% improvement in, in VO2 max, which is your measurement of cardiovascular function, okay? If you were to do what I talk about in the book, you would do five minutes three times a week, and during that five minutes, only 40 seconds is hard. The rest of it is actually so easy, it's boring. So we're talking about 15 minutes a week times eight. So that's two hours versus 40 hours. Okay, it's 20 times less work. If you did that, what do you think your VO2 max improvement would be? You got 2% when you put in 40 hours of hard work. 
Mm, How about 20%? It's 12%. 12, huh? But think about this. You spent two hours instead of 40 hours and you got 12%. Right. It's right, insane. Times. So why are we fetishizing getting up at five in the morning and running for an hour? I don't understand it. it. There is merit in actually experiencing pain every day. Humans have been doing this for a long time because a brief exposure to pain, even once a week, changes dopamine sensitivity. This is one of the many reasons ice baths are useful. If you take a cold shower, do an ice bath, you've got a change in dopamine signaling, you're fine. You don't have to run for an hour. So if running for an hour every day gets you 2% and sitting on an AI charged bicycle at Upgrade Labs or doing the stuff that I teach you to do in the book, well, geez, maybe you ought to do that instead of the suffering route. Yes, we are strong enough to suffer. If you're going to choose to suffer, which is actually okay, choose to suffer on the things that get you the most results. Right. Like overthrow a tyrant or something. You'd suffer that way. Don't do it like <laughs> running around in circles on a track. That's stupid. You gonna run for president, Dave? Fuck no. <laughs> Too smart for that. I like, I like to get things done. <laughs> So let me ask you this. Is this a little bit, what do you think of Tim Ferriss's four-hour body? Because this sounds, he, he kind of had the similar thesis. I don't know if his methods were similar to yours. But what's your take on what he said? His methods were, were not biohacking. I, I'm a fan of Tim. He's been on my show a couple times. And he would do things in four-hour body. Like if you want to learn how to swim, here's a technique to learn how to swim. Right. right? If you want to learn how to do this, do it in a certain way, right? And there is definitely an if, if effectiveness to this. But if, I mean, if, if I, I was to compare that stuff and, and things like a kettlebell get-ups, like, like these, a, a Turkish right. push-up kind of thing, those are cool, but those are based on the same thing exercise has always been. There is run away from tigers or pick up rocks. And what we did is we concentrated the rocks into kettlebells. And yes, there are fancy ways to pick up rocks that will put different muscles on than others. Like kettlebell swings are legit. Right, but they're not as legit as running an electrical current over your ass, or doing the other things in here, like what we do at Upgrade Labs, the the cheat machine, which is one where you you have an AI system resisting you, not gravity. And in the book, I saw I you doing this on Instagram. It was like you were doing a workout and you had electrodes, yeah, and you were saying. It's lightweight, but the electrodes make it hard. Is that the concept? Oh my God. I've, I've had walls of muscle, like cry uncle from electrodes. And that's huh. one of the many things. So there's all these pathways to send a signal into the body. And there's a new principle in this book that's not in any other book. And I think it's something that we're gonna prove out more and more. And it, I call it slope of the curve biology, which is a terrible name if you're in marketing, but that's okay. I have other parts of marketing that I do. <laughs> what, what this is, is the idea is that we believe that working hard, the amount of work we do makes us get results and makes us good moral human beings. The reality is that your, is that your, your moral status has nothing to do with how hard you work. Yeah. And results have more to do with the shape of the signal, not the amount of work you do. If you want to change your brain, you want to change your cardiovascular system, or you want to change your muscle, what matters is how quickly you can bring on the stress and how quickly you can turn off the stress. Your body will change if it has an extreme stress in a short period of time. And then as soon as it turns off, you meditate you bring your heart rate back down, you chill out. And the reason for this goes back to real basic biology you will see in a zebra. You see National Geographic, lion almost eats a zebra, a zebra gets away. As soon as the lion's gone, the zebra shakes its whole body and that's an adrenaline dump. And then the zebra starts eating grass. Now, what we do is we go to that same spin class and we say, oh, look, we climbed a hill, a tiger almost caught us. That's what your body thinks because your body's dumb and it's fast and you're smart and slow. And well, okay, tiger almost got you, no problem. But then you keep running because now you're running at 50% and there's another hill. You gotta go up that one, there's another hill. So you're telling your body, a tiger almost caught me, but it's still hunting me for a whole hour. And the tiger might look you know, like someone in spandex, but it doesn't matter because your body's dumb. It just knows that it has the physiological pattern of someone being chased. And it's going to allocate resources to survival, not to transformation. And that's why you get a 2% improvement from that model. 
But if instead you're like, okay, I did my two 20 second sprints. I got away from the tiger twice. Now I'm at peace. And if you read the chapter on minerals, you're drinking your danger coffee, uh, you're eating enough protein from animals, your body says, oh, look, I've got enough resources and I had a signal and I'm safe. Now I'm going to build. And, and that's the thing. And that works whether you're doing it uh, for any of the big five things I'm talking about here. It's take the body quickly to the edge of disequilibrium till it almost breaks and then back down. You can use grit to say, I took myself to the edge and I did it again. And I ran a hundred miles and I squatted 10,000 times. You're not helping. You're showing yourself how tough you are, but you're not causing the body to change in a way that's beneficial for you. And that's the big message in the book. I want you to get your time back. I want you to get your energy back. And I want to get revenge on that 702 hours of time I spent in the gym when it didn't work. I believed that hard work mattered. And people can say, Dave, shame on you. You're lazy. I'm going to make fun of you. Yes, you may make fun of me. Dude, look at my success. Okay, I, I am, I am a, actually, I am a lazy person. I'm super lazy, come to think of it. I, I do as little as I can possibly get away with to, to achieve the results I want. I just want a lot of results, so I'm willing to do the work, right? But it's a very different mindset. Then I'm just going to power through it. I can suffer. Dude, I can take it. I just don't want to, right? And that's okay. You're wired that way. So every ounce of energy you spend, it's sacred. Don't waste it. Let's say somebody follows this. They only need to work out two hours a day. What's your take on, because- Hopefully you don't mean a day. You mean two I mean, hours sorry, like a week. Month. A week, I meant, <laughs> my bad. What, what that, should that was two hours do? over two months for cardio, by the way. It, it was oh, only really? a half hour a week. Actually, sorry, no, it was only, yeah, 15 minutes a week is all I was talking about. But yeah, that's just for cardio. If you want muscles, you need another 10 minutes maybe. <laughs> So what do people do the rest of the time? Do you, by the way, how do you work when you're on your laptop? Are you sitting, laying, treadmill desk? What's your thing when you got to um, be, I mean, inevitably we're both sitting right now, but what do you recommend? I think it depends on your physiology. Uh, I've had a standing desk for years. When I moved to Austin, uh, I actually couldn't fit the bottom of the standing desk in the truck and I was tired of it anyway. So I left it <laughs> and, uh, um, so I'm sitting now in an Aeron chair, but I have a whole body vibration plate right behind here. I have a monitor that's oh, about three feet away from me and behind it about six feet away from me, I have a big monitor. So right now when I'm looking at you, you're on a screen six feet away and my notes for you are right underneath my monitor right here. So if I look at there, I'm looking at one screen, I look there, I'm looking at another screen. So I'm more worried about the angle of the screens and the fact that I have to change my focal depth all the time to work on two screens. Two screens next to each other is inferior if you're doing this versus where one's in the front, one's in the back. And I do that and then right behind that monitor, I can look out and see trees 200 yards away. I don't need reading glasses. I don't need glasses at all. My vision is 2015. I am biologically 39 and I'm chronologically 50. That's a great, well, you, we got, you just said a lot, but so is this <laughs> thing of having two focuses pretty important for eye health? It's terribly important and most people are missing it. Yeah, that's a great idea. I don't know why I haven't heard that before. You know, I, I've tried a standing desk. I don't, standing desk, I feel like humans weren't meant to have locked knees. So I like, I like a treadmill desk set real slow, you know. Are you a fan of 10, 000, the 10,000 step rule or do you think it's... Oh, uh, let me tell you about 10,000 steps. Let's talk. Right. I want to hear. I was CTO and co-founder of the first fitness watch company that could get heart rate from your wrist, the way your Apple watch does today. The company yep. was called Basis. We were based in um, San Francisco and we sold it to Intel a long time ago for like $100 million. So I studied this a lot and we could tell you your sleep, all the kind of stuff that your aura ring and everything could do now, but we were the first. So I, d I did my research on 10,000 steps. You wanna guess okay. where it came from? I'm, I'm worried to guess. <laughs> all uh, right. Former president. <laughs> no, nice. Uh, a Japanese company in the 1950s in, in, invented the first pedometer to, to count your steps. Okay. So they made up 10,000 so they could sell their dumb little belt mounted pedometers. There was no science behind it ever. And ever since then, we've been just saying that same stupid 10,000 step rule over and over and over. There is no 10,000 step rule. It is entirely not science based you just feel like you're a good person if you do it because someone told you, good boy, you walked 10,000 steps. Now, is walking a meaningful number of steps good for you because of piezoelectric effects and lymphatic circulation body? Sure, 
You should walk for 20 minutes a day. I do whole body vibration. Sometimes I walk too. It depends on the weather. That's good for you, but it's not exercise. And walking 10,000 steps, which actually takes a lot of time, probably isn't doing you much good. If you love it and you're getting a tan and you're talking you know, with a, a close friend and it's a social activity, yeah, go for a hike in the Andes. I have. But don't think you have to do it every day. If what you really wanted to do was invent some cool thing, maybe you could get it done and then go invent the cool thing and, and, and have both. That just seems more valuable to me. So no, 10,000 isn't useful. People eat more when they walk 10,000 miles a day. There's studies of that. Same with standing desks. If you have a treadmill desk or you stand on a desk, you just eat more calories. Your body will do that for you automatically. So should you stand if it's comfortable? Yes. Ideally, you have a combination of sitting and standing all day long and you walk at least a little bit every hour. I Right behind my monitor, there's a whole body vibration. I stand on it for a minute or two, which stimulates the whole body as if I'd walked 30 steps every second. Oh, this is interesting. We're, we're hitting all kinds of, uh, you're, you're busting all kinds of bubbles here. What about the protein bubble? How many grams do you think, let's say somebody's getting from good animal sources, your book talks about the importance of this. What, are you a one gram per pound of body weight type person? What's your kind of take? Well, just the most important thing you said there, you kind of glossed over, proteins are not all the same. So you cannot say that, you know, your brown rice protein or nine grams of gluten protein in your in your protein bar is the same as animal protein. That's something big food's trying to do to convince you to eat peasant food and pay for it like it's real food. So you you definitely hit on that, which I appreciate. Then it comes down to, even with animal protein, what is your goal? If your goal is longevity and you're doing radical life extension stuff like me, there's a, a body of evidence that says 0.6 grams of high quality animal protein per day on average would work. But the way you would do that is on a day when you're eating, you would eat one to 1.2 grams of protein per pound of body weight. And on the days when you're intermittent fasting, you'd have none. So it averages out to 0.6. If you're in a, I want to build mass on the body, then you're going to need at least a gram per pound of body weight. And I'm talking good quality protein, and you're going to have to take an enzyme with it in order to digest it all the way so you don't get like ammonia um, bodybuilder farts, because that's not attractive. <laughs> What's into that? Yeah. Whatever. Yeah. I, you need a chapter on that, how to avoid ammonia farts. You know, I kind of go, I, I base kind of, this evolutionary science on this hunter gatherer framework. So like hunter, a lot of what you're saying kind of jives with that hunter gatherers would hunt and then they would lay down and rest a lot. They were getting animal protein. I just read the newest sciences. They were getting about 50% animal proteins. And then they were getting 50% from gathering you know, tubers and berries and nuts and things. Um, but this question, you know, evolutionary mismatch. We live in a different world. We've got Wi-Fi. We've got, you know, these, I've got the blue blocker glasses on because you've got the light coming in. You've got what they call social jet lag where people aren't sleeping well. I found in tracking my own body, and I want to talk about this because I know you touch on this in your book and the concept of rest and sleep. Like, what's your take on sleep? You've had controversial takes on kale and, and how many hours a day to do cardio, do you agree with this eight hours of sleep? Obviously, there's different quality sleep, but what's kind of the rule of thumb you try to build around, especially, let's take life extension. What, are you trying to hibernate 10 hours a day? Are you trying to do the, you know, Donald Trump and Arnold Schwarzenegger say they only need four hours of sleep? Like, what's, what's your, what have you found in your body of work? As a really successful Silicon Valley entrepreneur, uh, I always hated sleep. Uh, uh -huh. the first part of my, I'm like, why do I need to do this? What a pain in the ass. I have more interesting things to do. Like literally, I just have fun, interesting challenges to solve and uh, probably some work stress and you know addiction to work and all that kind of stuff. Uh, so I was probably sleep deprived. But then I started looking at quality of sleep instead of quantity of sleep. And you, you have those same people like, well, you should walk 10,000 steps a day. They don't tell you why. And there is no reason why. And then they say, you should sleep eight hours a night. And they don't tell you why, because no one knows why. And then they say, and you should drink eight glasses of water a day. But they can't tell you how big the glasses are. 
This right. is just complete shortcut thinking. Our brains do that because they're trying to save electricity. The same reason you want to lay on the couch instead of go work out is the same reason your brain makes intellectual shortcuts like that. I don't approve of any of, of those kinds of things. When it comes to sleep, we just look at the science. The first big study where we collected enough data to look at length of sleep, much less quality of sleep, just length of sleep and how long you're going to live. We collected the data in the 80s, and there was so much data from 1.2 million people collected over three years, they couldn't crunch the data on 1980s Commodore 64 computers. So they had to wait until sometime in the late 90s when we had cloud computing starting up in a data center, and they crunched the numbers and said, holy crap. It looks like the people who live the longest sleep six and a half hours a night. And all cause mortality is higher for seven or eight hours or nine. If you sleep nine hours a night, you have a health problem. You are probably sick, right? And if that's what you need to function, you're on your, on your way to chronic fatigue syndrome. Or maybe you're overtraining and you really need that to recover. I don't know. But there is no evidence that says eight hours is some magic number. There's also individual variability. And the time when you go to sleep matters greatly uh -huh. because that controls your growth hormone release versus your dream state. And when you look at all this stuff, what I've did in a previous book is I talked about, you know, how, how do you want to do it? What you want to do is get as much sleep as you need in order to get 90 minutes of deep sleep and 90 minutes of REM sleep. And I do that reliably on six and a half hours. And I've done, I've tracked my sleep for more than 15 years. I used to wear a headband and everything for it. It just, it works. And for people who are interested, sleepwithdave.com is the funniest URL of my life. Everything I know about sleep is free on that <laughs> side. Like, people ask me this all the time. I am, I am like a, a preeminent sleep hacker. That's what I do. So it also makes me laugh every time I say it. I like that, sleepwithdave.com. I'm kind of hitting on all the, the things that I consider important. Let's talk about sex. Now, what's your goal, to live how long? I'm going to live to at least 180, um, but the real goal, I, I'd like to die at a time and by a method of my choice. Like okay. if, if I'll live to 180 if I want to. And when I do that, I would like to look and feel about like I do now or better. Sex function, do you think is your goal, you'll be able to still have relatively normal sex past age 100? You think that's a doable, possible goal? I, I think it's a limited goal relatively possibly normal no i just want to have normal sex thank you okay normal Actually, sex, really, but most people really are good. most guys are stopping at 75 yeah. let's I, say i'm talking about really good sex okay. there's all kinds of rejuvenation dude i've had stem cells injected in my uh, what, what can i say on your show can, can you I can say whatever you want it's I, a, i've had stem cells edit. injected in my dick you can do yeah. that it works did you notice fact, a difference yeah, between that and some of the other stuff I've talked about on the show, it, it, there's about an inch and a half difference I noticed. <laughs> well, that's, granted, that's, it's, it, it's only 10%, but no, I'm just kidding. You need, you need an <laughs> inch and a, how about inch and a half with Dave.com? That will no, get traffic. I, I will, will I'm actually working. I'm working on a show about that, but and like this is like the douchiest thing you can ever do is brag about dick size. So you're going to yeah, have to ask that. I'm just talking about the functionality. Do yeah. you feel well, like I, people I, I, can... I'm telling you, yeah. I'm telling you the stuff that improves function will change the size. <laughs> and, and that's just too tight. I, I, I don't know how else to just say it without saying it. And yes, this is like socially, sociologically, you're not supposed to, I'm not bragging. Uh, I'm just telling you, like someone has to say it. So yeah, it is malleable. You can control blood flow. You can take things like nitric oxide that will increase blood flow. There is absolutely no reason that 70-year-olds cannot be dating 36-year-olds if they want to. How do I know this? Because an 88-year-old on my board of directors, when I'm in my 20s, this guy had more energy than I did. After his wife passed away, he had a 36-year-old girlfriend. And they actually were in love. And they had energy that was compatible, not like the dirty old man thing. His name was Mike. I've seen it. What was his... What was he doing? Everything that's in the book. What was we didn't what, what, know what everything was he in the book back then? But he and other people his age, who were three times my age, taught me everything they were doing for anti aging. I'm passing the baton on from those guys, man. Is part of that the calorie restriction? I know there's been a lot of data with the mice and living longer with calorie restriction. You, is it more intermittent fasting then? Are you going a day two? So day one, you said you get one gram of protein from good animal sources. Day two, do you stretch out? Is there no intermittent fasting except every other day? Or is it lessened or lengthened on the short versus long days? 
All right. So I have a whole book on intermittent fasting called Fast This Way where I, I really go into detail on this. So the reality is that if you're tired or you lifted heavy, you probably don't want to do a long fast. Just fast more than 12 hours, you'll get benefits. So maybe that's a 14-hour fast that day. And then the next day, you didn't push yourself real hard so and you're, you're recharged. So maybe that's a 23-hour fast. You just wait till dinner, right? So it, it doesn't need to be the same and it probably shouldn't be the same every day. Um, and also... Um, you look at, okay, how long am I going to be in, an, in a heightened state before I get into a stress state? And people who do intermittent fasting understand maybe at two in the afternoon, you start getting a little bit like angry or anxious or a little bit cranky, right? Well, you just hit your fasting limit, right? Your body's starting to feel, I just said, you probably should eat then and work on stretching it just a little bit versus just like sitting there being all pissed off and kind of defocused because your body couldn't handle it the right way. So you can, uh, you can work on that. Um, but for for putting on muscle, you're going to have to eat more protein. And for anti-aging, you're going to have to do some intermittent fasting. Like th those are the two sides of the coin. How much of an actual experiment station like you have in Santa Monica is needed? Your book talks about how to do this in your living room. To live to 180, are people going to realistically be able to do that with things they can put in their living room or do they need to come to a place like you have fairly often? Well, I'm opening upgrade labs across the country right now. We've got a couple dozen in process. It's a franchise. Go to own and upgrade labs.com. You can open a biohacking facility in your neighborhood. We're doing across the U S and Canada to start. And if you want to a whole country license somewhere else we can talk to you, but I can't do individual franchises in other countries because of legal stuff. So it's it's an interesting interesting perspective where you're, you're thinking, oh, I, I probably will have access to one of these facilities. But if not, every single thing in Smarter Not Harder, when you buy the book, I tell you, here's the free version based on new knowledge. Here's the relatively cheap version. And here's the crazy billionaire version. And my job is to test the crazy billionaire stuff and then take the stuff that's worth it and not all of it is worth it. And then I put it in Upgrade Labs and then you pay a monthly fee like you would at the gym. The difference is you actually use it and it works. All the gyms today are based on a real simple idea. You're going to buy a membership and then your meat operating system, that part of you that's lazy, that keeps you alive, it's gonna keep you from going. People spend $400 million a year on gym memberships called ghost memberships. They never go. But your conscious brain knows that it, you're a good person if you mean to go. And your body's like, ha, 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 I got pizza and couches. You have no chance. And then the body wins and you feel bad about yourself. So um, what I believe is going to happen is that this knowledge will, it'll t it usually takes about 10 years from when I introduce stuff like in the Bulletproof Diet about lectins and oxalates and omega-6s and all that stuff. Um, in order to bring that into the world of biohacking and move the knowledge forward to the point that everyone's saying the same thing. It, it, it takes a while just for like the echo chamber. There's going to be people come in. They're going to copy this podcast. There's already someone right now rewriting Smarter Not Harder and putting their own name on it. Like this is kind of how all health influencers are, uh, unless unless you're talking about some new concepts like slope of the curve biology. That That is not – that is not – that didn't exist until this book, but you're going to see a bunch of people writing about it over the next five years and it'll slowly make its way into society. And so within 10 years, there should be at least a thousand locations for upgrade labs and this knowledge will be there. So there'll be some new device in your house that we haven't even thought of yet. That's going to let you take advantage of the principles, send a signal into the body to make it change and then make the body calm. And then you can change in a small amount of time. This will free up human effort to do things that matter more, like ask chat GPT dumb questions. In the book, you know, you talk about the different levels. You can go billionaire level and you can go, what's the simplest for somebody listening? They're buying them smarter, not harder. What's the simplest device or piece of equipment or furniture you can put in your house? The average person can afford to put in their house. That's a game changer. You know, I would recommend I mean, if you really want like a big biohack for the dollar, it's a piece of equipment called a Trism and the company is called True Light. This is a company I founded, so I have a bias here, but this is the only four color light spectrum device. It's very thin, but it's got four times more power than other things on the market. So you get this thing, it's portable. It, it's about, oh, I don't know, 
four feet long, three and a half feet long, and, and 14 inches wide. And you can put this thing over any part of your body or really your entire body. And red and infrared light and amber light have a really strong signaling effect to improve cellular metabolism. Um, they can affect electron flow inside your cells. They can affect inflammation. They can affect pain. Uh, they can affect digestion and sleep. So I travel with one of these things. And it's also something that raises nitric oxide. So if you're worried about being 75 and not having enough nitric oxide, which would mean not enough blood flow, which would mean that your erections don't work, you can lay down before bed, put it from your knees to your neck, and you're going to get a nice dose of red and infrared. And then you're going to wake <laughs> now, up in the seen, morning. This is what I see you on social doing. I've seen some of your posts. You've got like a red aura around you. You're not in hell. This will... I have never yeah, woken yeah, up that, with a kickstand yeah. on social. I just want to be really clear. <laughs> if you have, um, you might lose your verified badge. You might get a new one. Why don't you do a kickstandwithdave.com? I like these various micro websites with Dave. <laughs> Take your most controversial hacks. Oh, I've registered. I've registered tons of them. Yeah. So, but, but that's the light. This is this infrared. Is this cellular repair at like a micro level? Is that what's happening? There's different frequencies in the lights and frequency, just colors of light. Infrared light changes how thick or thin water is. Water can be kind of goopy okay. like jello, or it can be really, really liquid. It's called viscosity. So infrared light changes water's viscosity so that the water can be used in biological processes. When you drink a glass of water, your body can't use that water. So it takes the water, it holds it up against cell membranes made out of fats. It yep. warms it up with infrared light. That's called body heat. And then after it's been there for a little while, the water forms an exclusion zone. And that exclusion zone water is the basis of life. Now, you could say, Dave, I took biology, that's BS. Well, I gave $50,000 to the University of Washington where Gerald Pollack did this work and published multiple papers over years on exclusion zone water, and you can hey. see it on a microscope. So it's real. And infrared light forms better exclusion zone water, which means your body can more easily make electricity via ATP production. Red light adds electrons to the body. So you actually can get some energy directly from the red light, kind of like a plant, but not that much energy. But it um, it reduces inflammation in cells. So cells work better, they're less inflamed, and they have better water for energy production. Yeah. By the way, for those of you listening, go to tylopez.com slash Dave Asprey podcast. Don't forget the word podcast. I'm going to put the show notes and I'm going to put the link to his book and his other books. I've read some of your other ones. Uh, I think Superhuman's the first one I read of yours. So before we get into the health stuff, you're also a very successful businessman. What do you think, because we're going to talk on all these biohacks for the body and protein and all this, but what have you found for, forget physical for a second, making money? What is the greatest hack for you? Is it waking up at five in the morning is it a certain routine is it a mentor is it a book you follow a discipline what's kind of the thing that's allowed you to build you know nine figure businesses all right ty it is exactly the same thing that's in smarter not harder the new book it's being lazy here's the thing anything that sucks your energy pay someone else to do it anything that gives you more energy than it takes to do it do that and don't do anything else that's the recipe. I don't care when you wake up, wake up at the time where you feel best. Just because someone wakes up at 5 a.m. and, and you know, sweats or fasts or does whatever, what makes you think that that is why they're successful instead of the fact that they had successful parents <laughs> or didn't have successful parents? There is no causation between those behaviors. And we all love to fetishize, well, Elon Musk does this or does that. Well, Elon Musk is a different person. The whole point of Smarter Not Harder is to measure where you are now, look at what goals you have, right? And then take the technologies, the tools that get you there fastest. When I was young, I realized I sucked at project management. I'm working for a company called 3Com, a big tech company in the time. And I realized I just sucked at this. So I said, I'm gonna become strong at the thing that I suck at. I suck at project management because it makes me tired. I hate it. So I decided that I would address my weaknesses. And then I finally figured out after making and losing $6 million by the time I'm 28, that maybe 
if I just did the stuff that I really naturally did that gave me energy and power and I, I just asked for help on the stuff that where I sucked, I would become more effective. I am lazy. I have people do the hard stuff. The stuff is hard for me, but for them, it's not hard. For them, it's easy and they love it. And there are people who wake up with a green visor and they just love counting beans. I don't understand them. They're not my people. The ones who work for me are awesome. I just don't know how they do it, right? And they don't know how I name products or how I do the evangelist stuff I do or how I innovate. But I don't know. I won an award from from Forbes for starting one of the 25 most innovative countries. I won an award from Forbes for starting one of the 25 most innovative countries companies in the country, right? That's because I'm lazy. It's not because I work hard. By the way, I also work hard, but when I am going to work hard, I use the most effective tool on the planet and I do the things that I am good at and I don't do other people's jobs. That's how you make money. I don't know what you think about Bill Gates, but there's one thing he said that I think most people would agree on. He said, when I have something important to do, I look for a lazy person because they'll find a more efficient way to get it done. You know, I, I very much like that. Uh, you were asking about crazy stuff. Uh, I I actually knew Bill Gates before I was born. <laughs> oh, yeah. My mom truly was the first employee of the company that became Microsoft. So when she was pregnant with me, she worked for Ed Roberts, Paul Allen, and Bill Gates in Albuquerque, oh, wow. New Mexico. And literally, one of the founders of Microsoft bought my crib. How weird is that? That is insane. That's the <laughs> Seattle connection you have, or no? No, actually, that was Albuquerque. So Mitz was a company in Albuquerque. And when Bill realized he was going to have to pay state taxes, they moved to Seattle to avoid taxes. It was before they did that. But a little bit of, little bit of trivia there. So Bill Gates, the other thing that, that he did, yeah, look for someone lazy, brilliant piece of advice. Um, the other thing that, that really, if you want to get super rich, you should look into is monopoly powers and using uh, charities as a way to dodge taxes and then say you're donating money while keeping it in your pocket and controlling companies and then using that money to control public policies that puts money in your pocket. I've heard that works, but maybe that was more Rockefeller who taught it to him. Just saying. <laughs> that Rockefeller and various presidents recently. <laughs> By the Amen. way, do you, do you say what your political affiliation is or do you? I don't have a political affiliation. So why would I vote in a tribe? Both tribes are wrong about some things. I only care about individual things. And I'm gonna just be real super blunt here. If voting changed anything, they would make it illegal. They made it illegal to leave your house. You think they're gonna let you vote if it's gonna change something? Of course they're not. So why pretend? It's as important who you vote for as it is who you root for in the Super Bowl. It doesn't change anything. Well, with that said, now- Now I really pissed everyone off. Oh man. <laughs> yeah, the illusion of control is very addictive. <laughs> but if you live to 100 and you've got insights now, what do you think, let me ask you, this is a kind of esoteric question. Because I, I remember when I was a little kid, I was about eight, my mom was walking through the room and I said, mom, come watch these cartoons. And she said, oh, I don't like cartoons. I said, why? She said, well, when you're older, Ty, you'll stop larking, liking cartoons. And I said to her, mom, I'll always love cartoons, but eventually you don't love them. So it's hard to know what a current belief you have now is that eventually you'll think ch is childish. When you're a hundred 80 uh, that's you know you, you're a hundred years older than you are now do you think there's a danger in living that long because you'll look back and be like i wasted this i was like a child you know from one to 80 years old what we can cons currently consider old will be nothing you know 80 will be a mid 20 year old essentially one of the things that's given me an unfair advantage in uh in my entire career including in silicon valley you know, where I, I was a co-founder of a part of a company that, that was worth $36 billion on the public markets. The business unit that I helped to start did $100 million a quarter before I was 26 years old. Right, So I, I really did all this, but I didn't do all that stuff because I'm, I'm a super genius, Jerry. I'm smart. It's because I was just lucky that mentors showed up. People who were like 20 and 30 years older than me would tell me what to do. And even though I was kind of an arrogant punk, I would at least copy the most effective things. And the reason I can do biohacking I learned biohacking by spending five years with people three times my age who've been working on it for decades of their lives and they, they handed it to me. So what, I, what am I gonna do when I'm 100? Well, I'll be talking, if there are any, to people who are older than me. Hopefully I'll bring some people along with me. But as you, as you age, your job is to always have friends 20 years older or more and 20 years younger or more. And you wanna be really successful. Find someone who spent 30 years 
climbing the ladder in corporate America and became in charge of a big part of a business or was a CEO who's retired. And you know what? Have coffee with them and say, what did you know? That person will give you 10 years of acceleration on your career and they'll do it because it feels good to help someone, right? So you're actually offering them a gift. I didn't understand this until I was about 30. They want to help. No one wants you to suffer the way they suffered. The, it's the reason I write my books. If someone had just handed me smarter, not harder, when I was 19 years old and I was fat, I was in pain all the time, I had brain fog and chronic fatigue, I could have just read this thing. It would have taken me like 50 hours instead of 702 hours. And I wouldn't have spent all that money on size 46 inch pants. Like it would have radically changed my brain and my life. The knowledge wasn't there. So I write the books for someone who's 19 who just needs to know how shit works. Because if you do that, you can do way more than you ever thought you could. And what do I do now? I have friends who are in their 20s and 30s, and I still have friends who are in their 80s. Because that shows me where I am, and it shows me where I can go, and it still saves me time. There will be a time when I'm the oldest person maybe on the planet. I hope I'm not. I hope there's always someone older than me. When that happens, hopefully there will be a great source of knowledge for younger people. And I can be like, remember the last three times the government tried to steal all your rights? I do. Let's stop them this time. <laughs> Everything will be... There's nothing new under the sun. Well, by the way, in your book and just kind of in your bio, something that stood out to me, it's somewhat related to what we're talking about now, you raised your IQ. What's the bio <laughs> hack process by over 20 points, which is, that is a lot for people who understand, you know, statistics on, a, you know, the Stanford Binet IQ test, the average person's 100 some people say they're 200, but to move 20 is to move standard deviations. What, what, what was it literal physical things you did or a combination of physical Were you speed reading or you doing electrodes on the brain? What, what helped the brain? Well, it's a variety of things, but, uh, as Daniel Amen says in my, my documentary on mold, you actually, if, if you're running at low mitochondrial function, in other words, your, your brain needs electricity, you're not making enough electricity, you can gain IQ points just by having functioning cell membranes because now you can make enough electricity. So I was coming from behind because I had really serious brain damage from toxic mold. I fixed it and I repaired it. That was probably 10 IQ points. But then there's another thing, and I've written about this, especially in my book, Headstrong, um, where I talk about a, a kind of training that doubles your working memory. So working memory is how many numbers or letters or objects you can remember at a time. And this is really frustrating computerized training. And you do that, the average person gains about 12 points uh, from doing just that. On top of it, I run a neuroscience institute called 40 Years of Zen that's done brain upgrades for 1,500 entrepreneurs and celebrities and pro athletes and stuff like that. It's in Seattle, it takes five days. We hook your brain up to a computer and we remove a lot of the notifications that go off in your brain. And there's a chapter in Smarter Not Harder, uh, which is towards the end. I'll see if I can find exactly which number it is. And it's... Uh, is it chapter 12, Next Level Upgrade? Uh, that might be it. It's the one... Yep, I think that's it. Um, what what I'm talking about in there is actually brain upgrades. What, what are the technologies that you can do? Today, you can train yourself with feedback to move blood to the front of your brain where your thinking happens. If you have that skill, what? you will measurably change um, your score on tests of ADHD. So you can turn off ADHD by teaching yourself to put more blood where thinking happens. I almost failed out of Wharton because I couldn't do that. Um, when you're at 40 years of Zen, we actually can increase voltage in the brain. We can make neurons fire faster or slower. We can connect parts of the brain that are disconnected. It's like taking your BMW into the dining mechanic and you have a racing BMW when you come out. You can do that to your brain. I've done all of it. We have seven patents behind what we're doing. Like It's a real thing. The two huh. biggest things to raising your IQ are raising mitochondrial functions. So you have more power and then raising something called BDNF, which is brain derived nootropic factor. Uh, and there's a and I've written a whole book about how to do it. It's the New York Times Monthly Science bestseller list. Head Strong is that book. But if you just read the chapter in Smarter Not Harder on brains, you're going to get all the tools in order. And every chapter is the same. Here's all the stuff better than what you think you can do for brain training. It's crossword puzzles is, is the current best standard <laughs> or Sudoku or some crap. Uh, wordly or wordable or whatever that stuff is. That's mildly not going to do it. From there, I just tell you, here's all the stuff that lets you take control of your brain in small amounts of time so it does what you want. That's all I want you to have. 
I believe that when people have enough energy and their brains are working right, that we're wired to be nice to each other. We're also entirely impossible to program. So if you want to build a peaceful world, you need people full of danger. People are un, untrainable. They do what's right. They do what they choose. They do not do what they're told. And that's right. why my coffee company is called Danger Coffee. People running at their full power will always help each other. We'll stop our car. We'll help the lady across the street. We'll rescue the puppy and we'll be nice. And if instead you just have us all you know, tired and beat down and malnourished, eating fake burgers, running in circles around a track until we drop because we think it makes us better people, I don't think that creates the kind of world I want to live in. Yeah, for the, I think that's chapter, I was actually looking back at the book, chapter nine, brain and neuro, a hack target brain, brain and neuro fitness. Value. There you go. It wasn't chapter 12. I, I, I told people the wrong, but tylopez.com slash Dave Asprey podcast. We'll have the show notes. We'll have links to the book. We'll have links to the different um, products. And for those who want to franchise, Dave's got a new franchise for his biohacking labs. What do you think, speaking of the brain, like you're talking about here in, in uh, chapter nine of, of the new book, what do you think of kind of Elon Musk's this company where it's transferring consciousness, right? Or Neuralink. I mean, there's different kind of angles to this, but one of these people are going to prolong their life by just taking their consciousness and sticking it in a younger body. Is that going to ever happen? Is this realistic in, our, in the next hundred years? I doubt it. Uh, there's someone who has attempted a brain transplant. Yeah, I just saw in the news there was a brain yeah. transplant recently. Yeah, it, it seems like a poor strategy. The The much better strategy is learn how to upgrade the hardware you have now before you replace it and learn how to selectively replace hardware in the body. There are systems that repair everything in the body. You just have to create the environmental conditions and the signal to do it. And with peptides, uh, genomics, um, even gene editing, um, there's a very, very bright future for you being able to tell your body to regenerate a certain part. Uh, for instance, I'm about to do a new procedure where I'm going to take my own stem cells out. I'm going to de-age them and put them back in, uh, which is which is relatively new. Uh, and then, uh, man, there's there's so much coming down the pipe for that stuff. So there's no reason that you shouldn't maintain your body as you go instead of throwing it away and getting a new one. Like there's just what about the vampire thing. blood stuff? Do you did you see that validity to the young blood? Do they take young blood out of eighteen to twenty five year olds and you know essentially give people blood? I've got two of them chained under the bed. And it <laughs> no, I, I did write about this, and there is there were no okay. studies, so there is really good mouse science that says if you take a young mouse blood and put it in old mice, the old mice get younger and vice versa. What's going on is in the plasma of your blood, the non-cell part of your blood, the liquid, there's a bunch of toxins in there. So what I do now is I take my blood out, I wash it, and I put it back in. Okay. It's a, pr a procedure called EBOO. They take your blood out uh, using a dialysis filter. They ozonate the blood. The filter pulls out inflammatory compounds and extra proteins you don't need, and then the blood goes back in clean. There's another one that's more advanced that I'm about to do called plasmapheresis where they actually take out your plasma and replace it with clean, fresh plasma. And that, again, it's about just cleaning up the Petri dish of your body. One of the things that keeps you young is detoxing on a regular mm -hmm. basis. And if you're looking at, at life from a smarter, not harder perspective, okay, what is the thing that detoxes you most quickly or with the least amount of work? That's what I want you to do. The trap that we can fall into when we're high performance human beings is, well, I'm just going to spend all my time doing the things that give you results, which means you never get results because you spend all your time exercising, biohacking, meditating, uh, making lists, or doing whatever you think is going to get your results. So you need to allocate what I do about 45 minutes a day of biohacking time. I'm going to do something during that time to make myself better. Maybe it's this five minute cardio thing we're going to talk about. Maybe it's something that puts muscles on in 10 minutes. Uh, maybe it's actually meditating or maybe it's putting electrodes on my head and meditating 10 times faster because the computer tells me I'm doing it wrong. I'm just going to pick something and do it. It doesn't have to be the same every day. I'm not going to do everything every day. I have other stuff to do. So you, I mean, in many ways, you're a, you're a creator, you're an inventor. So is your idea, this is my core passion. 
I'm a creative, I'm a, I invent, I pioneer. And so I want to do all these other things. And hence the title of the book, Smarter Not Harder, in a re- very smart way, very concise. I'm knock it out. You just said in 45 plus, you know, 45 minutes a day. And then what do you do the rest of the day? Are you spending time coming up with the next big thing? Like what, what's the daily routine if you reduce everything to where you're not even needing to go to the gym or you don't need to jog or you don't, you know, what, what keeps you busy? I mean, I have, uh, I, I have about a New York Times bestseller every 18 months. It takes a couple thousand hours. It's a full-time job to write one of those. Uh, I have almost 1,100 episodes of The Human Upgrade with hundreds of millions of downloads. I do two episodes a week every week. Uh, I live in Austin. I'm single. Uh, I have Upgrade Labs, which is a major focus for me right now. That's my next potentially billion-dollar company. Um, where we're growing really rapidly with franchisees um, all over the country. People are just feeling, even I can be in business making people better instead of selling them stuff that doesn't work. I want to do that. So Upgrade Labs is a major focus. Um, I've got dozens of people working for me across oh, eight different companies. Uh, and I have a life. <laughs> and I have teenagers. Uh, they don't so what's single me. life in Austin like? Or what, what's the, yeah. When's the dating hack book? It could also be called, it should be called Harder, Not Smarter. How about that one for the dating? <laughs> the Just story invert of my the dating title. Life. Nice. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if I'm, if I'm the expert on that. Uh, let's just say that I'm, uh, uh, I, I am not interested in a monogamous relationship anytime soon. So I'm just enjoying being single and um, spending a lot of time with friends and um, just being social. So it's a lot of fun. So you got the Tony Stark type life huh you got the you got the biotech company you got man i I don't know i don't think i'm as cool as robert downey jr but i at least eat steaks so actually i am cooler yeah he 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 does he looked better when he was eating oh poor guy i just want to sit down with him and like have dinner be like dude it's okay like the vegan thing it's one of the things smarter not harder it doesn't work like you have to measure whether i was a vegan i was a raw vegan like it trashed me it took me two years to heal from that and i you know, I just don't understand it. So I, um, I understand the desire to do it. It's just all of the reasons for doing that don't work. And so, um, I, I would just say what I want to do is I want to feel full energy, full power every day. I want to wake up with something meaningful to do. I want to spend time with cool people who are exploring consciousness or exercise physiology or neuroscience or rocket science, whatever's interesting. And that's what I want to do. I, I don't want to you know, sit there and look at spreadsheets all day. So that's what I choose to do is not do that. It's good. I'm glad I like, I like podcasts. I like learning from people. There's it's, it's a never ending world of needing to learn inspired by other people's I'm inspired by creativity. This kind of interview, it's good for the interviewer for, it's good for you. It's good for me. And that's why I do the same reason you do. So I get to learn from experts like for free. It's amazing. So I always wrap up with two questions. So question number one, you lived 180, like you said, you set the time and method when you choose to move on from this world and this life. What do you want the celebration, the gravestone? What should it say about you? Uh, nothing. He was a what? He it was a- absolutely nothing. I'm hoping that they chop me up in pieces and give me a Tibetan sky burial where birds eat me. I don't give two shits about what people say about me after I die. Why would I care? All I want is the changes that I've made the the new knowledge I've introduced. I would like those to live on. I do not care if I'm associated with it. Who cares? Like read a history book, like who name anyone who did something 400 years ago. Yeah. It's very (laughs) weird. I always say, I I don't care. And even if you can remember 400 years ago, I mean, humans as a modern civilization, let's say is 10 to 25,000 years, name somebody from 12,000 years ago. Worrying about your headstone is it's like masturbation. Yeah. It, it feels good, but nothing productive happens at the end. I can't believe he fucking froze for that. God no, damn, I got it. I didn't bitch. freeze. I heard it. <laughs> Let me ask you the last question. So you've got children. Let's say aliens are coming to Earth and you're going to be pulled to Mars to live out the rest of your 180 years. Uh, what? And you got time to write a paragraph for humanity and your children. What does that paragraph say? Even though I agree it's not important, you know, you're not trying to live on in a vain, egotistical way, but 
What's that one paragraph? Not a page, not a sentence, but about a paragraph. What does it say? It can be about life, health, business, whatever you would deem most important. Uh, I would say pay attention to what uh, Native Americans have said about seven generations down. If you destroy your soil, you're going to hate your life. Probably what I'd say, because ultimately we do that. All, we're, we're manifestations of stuff from the soil. And if they keep doing glyphosate and atrazine and all the other crap they're spraying around, will they distract us with carbon dioxide stuff? Um, we won't have to worry about seven generations from now. So I, I would just say like those are the real important things. You got to look at the long-term impact. If we'd have done that, there would be no plastic packaging right now. That was from some guy in the late 50s who just said, well, this is cheap. Just never thinking about it another generation or two. And now we're eating that plastic <laughs> in our fish. <laughs> so and we've, we've got to do some long-term thinking here. Um, and that's the thing. Uh, the other thing I might say is something from Smarter Not Harder it is I would just say there is an invisible consciousness inside of you that controls what you see in the world. And it has a third of a second to take action. So don't believe everything you feel. Pretty profound. Well, thank you. Uh, I want to encourage everybody listening. I've enjoyed Dave Asprey's books over the years, enjoyed meeting him back in 2014 in the garage, and uh, we're back with the nine-year reunion. TyLopez.com slash Dave Asprey podcast. We'll have the link to his book on different platforms, his platform, Amazon, Audible, and then show notes, links to different, uh, he talked about a few pieces of equipment, We'll put some links there. So, Dave, my friend, until we meet again, I was in Austin not too long ago. I will uh, look you up next time you're there. Thanks, Ty. 